Okay, um, I'm, I'm back again, um, this time in the role as, as Chairman of the National Medical, Scientific and Welfare Committee. Uh, and just briefly, that committee is a group of doctors, uh, physiotherapists, uh, former players and administrators who look at general player welfare matters with a specific emphasis on medical matters and injury matters. The sort of people we have in our committee are Dr. Pat O'Neill, the former Dublin player and manager, Kevin Moran, who's the Donegal team doctor, uh, ex-players, we have Enda McGinley from Tyrone, who's also a physiotherapist, Enda McNulty from Armagh, Oshin McConville from Armagh, Carl Moore, the former Galway hurler, uh, then we have a nutritionist, Karina uh, Tobin, who's, who's a daughter of Johnny Tobin, the ex-Galway player and the current uh, coaching manager in, in Connacht. Uh, we also have Edwina O'Malley, who's a research physiotherapist who works in the uh, Santry Sports Clinic. So we have, uh, we have a lot of good expertise there, a lot of practical expertise uh, as well sometimes to you people on the ground that Croke Park committees are a no-no and, and what have they uh, to bring to the picture. So hopefully um, we are doing some useful work that can inform your day-to-day -day activities. I'm going to do a whistle-stop tour now of, of three uh, topics. Anti-doping and supplement use in the GA, uh, the GA's concussion guidelines and return to play protocols and our injury database and the GA15 injury prevention initiatives which hopefully uh, you have heard about. So in terms of anti-doping and supplement use, um, we've been doing testing at senior inter-county levels since 2001 and you may have heard a little bit about this in the news lately as we've introduced blood testing uh, from this season. Now for people like you working with uh, adolescents and underage squads, anti-doping isn't relevant in the sense that there's no testing done. But everybody in the GA is subject to the anti-doping rules, so they apply to the players uh, that you're working with and to you as coaches in the same way as they do uh, to inter-county teams. We test 100 players each year. That's done by Sport Ireland, formerly known as the Sports Council. We've thankfully only had two positive tests in the last 15 years, and one of those uh, was subsequently dealt with by a, a therapeutic use exemption and uh, there was one suspension of a Monaghan player last year. So we're pretty, pretty good record and a lot better than some sports. Um, why do we do this? Well, given the commitment of all players, it's essential to ensure that we have a level playing field. So if we had no rules or guidelines on this, we shouldn't be naive enough to think that somebody wouldn't try it. So it's absolutely in the interest of a living playing field. And we also want to preserve the integrity and image of our national games. We've only to look at international sport, particularly athletics, um, in recent times and see the damage it's done there and also cycling uh, before that. Um, once you have a reputation uh, for a non-clean sport, it's very hard to ever shake that. So we ban substances uh, for three reasons. Uh, they can enhance performance unfairly. They can endanger the health of players. Uh, and that's a, that's a big issue. You know, they've had cases in uh, basketball in the States where guys were taking hormone treatment for cattle and so on. And, and you can imagine the long-term impact of doing things like that. And it's against the spirit of sport. Like we all want to win, we all want to be competitive, but there is an absolutely a spirit to sport uh, that you play it fairly. So uh, the WADA is the International uh, Doping Association, and this is from the uh, Youth uh, Olympic Games in 2014. I am an athlete who has the right to participate in clean sport. I will embrace the spirit of sport, respect my competitors, my sport, and all those involved in my sporting endeavors. I will play true and say no to doping. So doping is about fair play, and at the end of the day, we're all passing through. The integrity and the longevity of our games are, are hugely important. And I suppose in relation to doping and in relation to the rules that apply in the GAA, there's a strict liability on the player. It's your body and your responsibility. So ultimately, it's up to the player to inform themselves. It's up to the player to say no if they ever come under any pressure uh, to take uh, performance enhancing uh, items. The consequences, they're serious. Number one, you'll get banned. And number two, it can be for a minimum of four years. So it can ruin your, your sporting career. So what are the consequences of a positive test for an inter-county player? Your playing career, inter-county and club, <coughs> applies at all levels. You would be suspended from all sports from a minimum of four years to potentially for life. It can have a huge impact on your health. Number one, if you're caught. Uh, the, the stress levels associated with that are huge, the reputational damage. Uh, the physical impact of taking uh, uh, you know, dope substances uh, can be very significant. Certainly, I'm not too sure many people who want to employ people who have a reputation uh, for taking banned substances. 
And then there's a whole reputational factor with your family, club, friends, mentors, teammates, opponents, media, the whole lot. In other words, it just can destroy your body, it can destroy your sporting career, and it can destroy your reputation. And I don't think any of us would want to see that happening to any player in our association. So the message is, uh, it's certainly just not worth the risk if you ever come across it. And the key thing about it is, sometimes this can happen without it being deliberate. So you have to be very careful, uh, you as coaches, even with players under uh, your management and control, uh, they can come across things, they can be taking things, they can learn about things in the world of the internet. Uh, anything is possible to search how you can improve performance. So something relatively innocuous can contain banned substances. And that brings to the subject of supplements and herbal remedies. And I'm sure you could, you know, you find them everywhere now. And as I say, in particular, if you search the internet. So it's very important uh, to be aware of the risks here uh, for players, not just in terms of getting caught, it's the risks that pose uh, to a player's health and, and body and long-term uh, capability. So pre-workouts, they're just examples of the sort of things that uh, people can take. You can purchase them, as I say, anywhere. Sometimes they're sold by people, uh, just going around selling them. There's often an attempt to get high-profile players to be involved in selling supplements. So people take it for granted, therefore, that they are of a, an appropriate standard and quality. That may not be the case. Looking at the ones there at the bottom of the page, Frenzy, um, and that's uh, been uh, drawn attention to in the United States. Uh, because uh, it was discovered uh, to uh, contain methamphetamine-like compounds, which are banned. So it's very hard to understand, and something like methamphetamine, it has about 20 different descriptions. So for an ordinary player, an ordinary coach, any of us, to understand the implications here is quite significant. So it's something you do need to be very careful about. And supplements are often more difficult than medicines. Uh, you can go to the, a doctor and he'll generally be able to give you good ad uh, advice and guidance on medicines. But when you go to supplements, number one, they're not classified as medicines. They can't be checked as easily and completely. There's little regulation either in Ireland or internationally on the supplement industry. Ingredients are often left off the label. Ingredients, as I mentioned, can be written in various ways and there can be cross-contamination due to human error. And sometimes, you know, supplements will be brought to players at a, an adolescent or early adult age where they'll be told, well, the you know, the Limerick team, the Cork team, the Kilkenny team, the, the Dublin footballers, they're taking these type of supplements, so it must be okay. And they may well be. But there are different standards applied often to the same products. And there are specific levels of testing done uh, that the higher level athletes uh, get to take. Uh, and that testing isn't always done on the product that's available to the general public. So it's something that's perfectly safe uh, and has the right ingredients for elite players, let's say, may not always be of the same standard when it's available to the general public. So there are a lot of risks here. And um, so the key message is before you take any supplement, make sure you know what it contains, but also make sure you know what it does. Uh, because is this going to have any form of positive impact? Are you a victim of marketing? Are you a victim of unscrupulous people? Is it really people trying to make money at your expense? Or could it potentially destroy your career? There are a lot of risks there. And, and that's just an example. They look good. You know, think words like uh, uh, delight, mega, stim, elite. You know, those words in themselves. Toning stack. Uh, they generate uh, a belief that these things are going to make a genuine improvement. And often they're seen as a shortcut to performance. Uh, the reality is they are often the opposite. So. Nobody can give you a guarantee that a, a supplement is free from bad substances. So you need to assess the need. You need to assess the risk, not just of getting caught, but what's it going to do for you. And you need to be aware of the consequences. So the one piece of advice we would be saying to coaches like you is um, supplements uh, in general, there's no need to use them. Avoid use uh, if at all possible. And where they are being used, make sure there's a specific need and that the benefits are clearly understood and defined. If you want to learn more about it, uh, look at ga.ie. There's an e-learning course on the whole area of anti-doping, and there's further resources described there. And also the Irish Sports Council and WADA, the International Doping Association, has what is called the Real Winner e-learning course, and they also have advice on supplements. And TUEs, TUEs are therapeutic use exemptions, so if you're an asthmatic, for instance, you can get permission to take certain medicines. So next uh, uh, topic on my Whirlwind tour is the GA's concussion guidelines and return to play protocols. 
And I suppose concussion has been in the news lately for a few reasons. Number one, uh, as we head into the Six Nations, it's very topical in rugby. And I don't know if any of you saw in the past week there was an issue uh, where there was a dispute between a doctor and a referee in a school's rugby game because we hear about the concussion sub in rugby, but that only implies at the professional level. At school's level, they have exactly the same principles as we have, uh, which is, if in doubt, take them out. And that's the referee's job in rugby, uh, and a doctor tried to overrule him, but the referee insisted that the player should be taken off. And we also had the incident uh, in the Cork versus Mayo football game a couple of weeks ago, uh, where Lee Keegan um, wasn't taken off, and Mayo subsequently issued a statement uh, saying they should have taken him off early, which was hugely, uh, brave, I suppose, of Mayo to admit that, and, and the Mayo doctor, uh, Sean Moffat, is a great guy. He's actually played a huge part in the development of research in the GA and concussion and the development of our guidelines. Uh, but that's the sort of uh, exposure the risk of concussion uh, needs. So I'll just briefly uh, run through these with you. Again, very important with under 18 players. The people at most risk of long-term damage from concussion are under 18s of both sexes and uh, women in general. Uh, it's not to say that adult men are, aren't at risk from damage to concussion, uh, but, and we know that looking at sports in the States, uh, but there are risks uh, in particular for women and for uh, anybody under 18. So what is concussion? Uh, often uh, not uh, understood properly. Puts relatively simply and in non-medical terms, it's a brain injury and it can be caused by a direct or indirect hit to the player's head or body. Generally, it's seen as a head injury. It can be caused by a hit to the player's head or body. Um, typically, uh, there is an immediate onset of short-lived signs and symptoms around dizziness, and you know, there's about 40 different uh, immediate symptoms, dizziness, grogginess, not knowing where you are, etc. But it can be more subtle than that as well, so the signs and symptoms may evolve over a number of minutes of hours, and that really is why we have the sort of guidelines and protocols that I'm going to go into now. And ultimately, uh, unless you're a doctor, you can't diagnose concussion. I was talking to a journalist after the uh, Cork Mayo game and he was saying to me, oh, the player didn't look concussed and I can understand why they did it. And I said, hold on a minute, neither he nor I can diagnose concussion. You can observe the signs and symptoms, but it's up to a doctor to diagnose it. And this is something to be very aware of when you're working with players. So the guidelines are our key principles. Well, the fact that it's a brain injury. Obviously, if I said to you anything, you were doing something that could cause a brain injury, it's going to cause alarm. So the key message is, slightly highlighted here, any player suspected of having sustained a concussion should be removed immediately from the field and should not return to play on the same day. If in doubt, take them out. Any suspicion that somebody has uh, received a concussion, take them off and they don't play again without getting medical treatment. It is an evolving injury, so it's important to monitor the player after the injury for progressive deterioration. So if you take off a player and he seems fine after a training session or a game, you still need to get him seen because something can happen when he goes home, he can get sick, vomiting, various different signs. So it's very important that uh, there is medical attention. And look, we see in high profile games, there are doctors and physios there, but at over 95% of our games, there are no trained medical personnel around. So we're very much reliant on parents, on people like yourselves, uh, to show common sense and intervene. So as I've mentioned, it's a clinical judgment. So um, if you have a suspicion of concussion, there must be adequate rest of at least 24 hours, and then there's a gradual return to play protocol, which is documented in detail in our guidelines. But specifically for players up to the age of 18, and this goes across most sports, you should have a mandatory two-week rest period and then follow a gradual return to play protocol. So there are signs and tests in terms of there's return to learning, so you go back to school first, uh, you return to certain types of activity. In the early days, you avoid all sorts of interaction with uh, phones and devices, etc. So it's hugely important that the gradual return to play protocol is observed. And you don't, even if you stay, stand down for the two weeks, that in itself isn't good enough. You need to get medical clearance by a doctor before returning to play because concussions can last, uh, have impact for longer. I, my daughter had concussion when she was 10 a few years ago and she didn't fully uh, get back to normality uh, for about six weeks after it. And it was a relatively innocuous bang that she got. So it's very important uh, to get the medical intervention and stand players down. And players will tell you they're okay and they're fine to play. They're not. Simple message. So you need only take one message, hopefully from me on concussion. If in doubt, sit them out. Um, so 
by doing that, the vast majority of players who suffer a concussion will make a full recovery. But players, and you as coaches, if you don't follow the guidelines, you can cause long-term consequences to the player. Now, I don't want to scare or frighten anybody here, but it is something to be aware of. The two main things that draw to your attention are there can be permanent brain injury, and that's something we're seeing with the mass lawsuits in the States now in relation to American football and so on, the long-term consequences. Now, I know they're taking heavier hits in that sport, and they're taking heavier hits in rugby as well, um, but it's something we have to be conscious of. Our own injury research suggests that concussions form less than 2% of our total injuries. It's probably underreported a bit, but it's relatively minor. But because it's such a significant injury, we have to manage it well. So there's a risk of permanent brain injury and various other things. There are links being established to Parkinson's disease and so on, which is certainly something we wouldn't want to see anybody developing. And a key thing for you dealing with underage players is second impact syndrome, and that is potentially fatal. And second impact syndrome is where you get a second concussion when you haven't recovered from the first. And that's what happened. You remember there was a young rugby player in Belfast who died a number of years ago. He had second impact syndrome. So that's the key thing that you have to watch out for in terms of players not coming back quickly. So there is loads of information out there on concussion, and often an absence of research, but for further information for players themselves, for parents, but you will have to intervene. Most players will not volunteer to come off. They won't recognize they have a concussion. Players, parents, medical personnel, coaches, and referees. Now referees in Gaelic games don't have a formal role to play in relation to concussion. We do educate them on it, and we encourage them to draw to the attention of team managements. But there's an e-learning course there uh, on learning.ga.ie, and there are specific information sheets for players age five to 18, and I suggest you get those and give them to all members of your development squads for adult players. You should look at the one for parents and coaches, and there's also one for referees. And there's a poster uh, for all GA clubhouses and dressing rooms, and I'd ask you to make sure they're up wherever you train. And that's the poster. It's recognized, report, rehab, and return. It gives you the symptoms. You don't always get knocked out, but if in doubt, you sit them out. And finally, I'll conclude by a brief reference to the GA injury database and the GA15 <coughs> injury prevention warm-up routines. So a lot of what we do as a committee is about research and ensuring uh, that we can provide best practice advice uh, to players and coaches at all levels about injury prevention. Um, we have a national injury database. It's in operation since 2007. And that's done with inter-county teams. And we have uh, physiotherapists with inter-county teams all around the country providing invaluable data to that. It tracks injury occurrences and trends in the GA of senior inter-county teams. We work with UCD on it. There's a full-time researcher there uh, who works on this for us. And what it does is it gives us the foundation for further research. Where do we need to go into more research? So you'll all be aware there are a lot more instances of hip surgery in recent years. So we have Dr. Noel McCaffrey, former Dublin player, doing a two-year research program with two inter-county adult teams and two inter-county under-21 teams at present, all in, in football, but the, 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 uh, it will be relevant across both sports, into why we're having uh, so many hip injuries and hip surgeries in, in recent years. So that's the sort of work we identify a trend, and then we do some research and try and come up with prevention programs from that. And obviously that enhances overall player welfare. Owen spoke about looking after players and making sure they had a long career. That's our ultimate objective. So what do we learn from this sort of database? This is just a sample of, of the data we got in, in 2015, and it's relevant uh, to everybody who's working with players. So 14% of all football injuries are overuse injuries. Uh, the corresponding figure for hurling is only 6.6%, uh, and that in itself is interesting, and it's suggesting that at football, we have a lot more players working on multiple teams at the same time. And even if you look at this time of the year, you can see the reality of that, because as a, a good 20-year-old footballer, you're probably on a county senior squad, a county under 21 squad, and, play, and, and playing Sigerson at college. So that's, that's placing huge demands uh, on players. Uh, recurrent injuries, they, again, Owen spoke about the pressure uh, and, and the, the game uh, that, that they played against Kilmacott Crokes and, and the work he did two days in advance. Um, and guys coming back early from injury. But recurrent injury accounts for 24% of all injuries in football and 19% in hurling. Those statistics are frightening. So at least one in five of the injuries we're getting are because players are coming back too quickly from injury. And you have a real role as a coach there to make sure they don't, and certainly not to encourage them, but also to try and identify situations where they're doing that. It's a very powerful message, because no matter how good you are as a coach, if a player is injured, he can't play. And that's a significant challenge for us as an association at all levels. 
Most injuries in Gaelic games are non-contact injuries and this is a positive I suppose when you talk about things like concussion. So um, only 28% of injuries in football are contact and you, as you'd expect slightly si higher in hurling at 36%. But unlike a lot of other sports, they're non-contact. Um, the risk of injury increased sequentially with age in hurling, so the older you get, and I suppose Owen's comments kind of reflected that as well, the more likely you are uh, to get it. But the focus at under 21 was with those uh, exiting the under 21 grade, so we were seeing most injuries in the 21 to 24 year bracket. And in terms of that translating into GA policy, it's figures like that that are driving the current uh, proposals from Porrick Duffy uh, to get rid of the under 21 grade in football as it is now to reduce it to under 20. And lower limb injuries, and this is a huge research area for us as well, lower limb injuries account for nearly 80% of all injuries in football and 70 in hurling. Uh, so and I suppose the ones we have to be most concerned about there is the ACL or the famous uh, cruciate injury. The GA15 warm-up is a routine that was introduced as a result of the research uh, we were doing, developed by Dr. Catherine Blake and John Murphy in UCD in conjunction with coaching and games uh, nationally in Croke Park. So it's a standard warm-up routine. I know nothing about warm-up routines and coaching, uh, but the one thing we do want to say is that uh, following this uh, routine, there are uh, details available on ga.ie. You should hear it through coaching structures, certainly promoted by the national, provincial and county uh, coaches. It's about reducing the incidence of injury and getting players, particularly at the younger age group, to adopt the right mechanics early on means that those practices stay with them for the lifetime of their career as a player.